Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying these stories and ready for some creepy cosmic chills. And show some love by hitting that like button. And don't forget to subscribe if you're new here for more awesome content. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Any suggestions or just saying hi is awesome. And remember to laugh a little, it's good for the soul. The static shouldn't be getting stronger. Not out here. Every hour the white noise in my radio grows louder, drowning out NASA's automated signals. At first, I thought it was just solar interference. Normal space stuff. The kind they warned us about in training. But solar noise doesn't form patterns. It doesn't whisper your name in your dead wife's voice. The emergency beacon on my shelter blinks steadily. 2,147 hours since touchdown on Mars. 89 hours since I lost contact with Earth. 16 hours since the last time I saw Captain Rivera walk past my window. Which should be impossible, since I watched him die three weeks ago. My hands tremble as I adjust the radio again. The static shifts, almost like it's responding to my touch. Between the bursts of noise I catch fragments of sounds that make my skin crawl. Metal grinding on metal, distant screams, and something that sounds like thousands of insects clicking their mandibles in perfect synchronization. This is Dr. James Keller of REZ7, attempting emergency contact with Houston. Please, respond. My voice sounds hollow even to me. I'm recording unexplained phenomena at base camp Hawking. Request immediate. The lights flicker and my tablet screen goes black. When it reboots. All my recorded data from the past week is gone, replaced by a single image. A photo from my personal files that should have been encrypted. It's from my wedding day, except something's wrong with it now. In the background, standing among our guests, there's a figure I don't remember. Its face is too long, its limbs too thin, and it's looking directly at the camera. Through the shelter's reinforced windows, the Martian landscape stretches endlessly in every direction. Crimson dunes ripple under a pale sky, broken only by our mining equipment and the massive radio telescope we assembled after landing. The telescope that started picking up those strange signals from beneath the surface two days before everything went to hell. The numbers keep climbing. My mining crew found something out there in Sector 7. Something that was buried so deep it took our most powerful drills three days to reach it. We thought we'd discovered ruins, evidence of ancient Martian civilization. Captain Rivera was so excited, he broke protocol and ordered an immediate excavation. We didn't find ruins. We found something alive, something old, something that had been waiting. The static grows louder, and now I can make out words forming in the noise. We saw you coming. We see everything. All the lonely dots of light, all the empty spaces between. My tablet chimes with an alert. Motion detected outside the shelter. The external cameras show nothing but red sand and equipment. But I know better. I've learned to watch the shadows. They move differently now, stretching in directions that defy physics. Sometimes they form patterns that hurt my eyes. Geometries that shouldn't exist in our reality. A soft tapping starts up against my window. Tap, tap, tap. Perfect rhythm, like a metronome. Like something intelligent trying to get my attention. I shouldn't look. Every fiber of my being screams not to look, but I do. There's a handprint on the outside of the glass. It's pressed deep into the reinforced material like it was made in wet clay. It has too many fingers, and it's on the inside of the outer layer. Something is getting in. The handprint vanished after three hours, melting back into the glass like it had never existed. But I know what I saw. I've got the video from my tablet to prove it. Though every time I watch it, small details change. In the latest playback, I swear I can see something moving behind the glass, just out of focus. The mining logs from Sector 7 are still intact. At least the ones from before we broke through into that cavern. Standard geological data. 
density readings, mineral compositions, subsurface radar scans, everything normal until we hit that perfectly smooth wall 50 meters down. No natural formation could have made something so precise. Captain Rivera said it looked like polished obsidian, except it absorbed our strongest lights completely. I pull up the video from his helmet cam, recorded just hours before he died. The footage is degraded, full of visual artifacts, but I can still make out the basic sequence. Rivera's gloved hand touching the black surface, the ripple effect that followed, like dropping a stone in water, his startled curse. Then the wall, opening. The video goes white with static after that, but the audio continues for another 32 seconds. I've listened to it hundreds of times now trying to understand. First comes Rivera's heavy breathing, then the sound of boots on stone, a gasp, and finally his last words. Oh God, it's beautiful. The geometry, it's solving everything. Don't you see? Don't you see how it all connects? The rest is screaming. My tablet chirps. Another atmospheric alert. The oxygen levels outside have risen another 0.3%. Small, but impossible. Like something is slowly transforming the Martian atmosphere. I think about the strange growths I've spotted on the rocks near the mining site. The ones that look like coral, but move when you're not looking directly at them. The static in my radio has changed pitch. Now it sounds almost like singing, a chorus of inhuman voices harmonizing in frequencies that make my teeth ache. Between verses I hear snippets of familiar voices, my dead wife Alexandra asking why I left her alone, Captain Rivera describing endless geometric patterns, my mother humming the lullaby she sang when I was small. They're trying to get inside my head, but they're already here aren't they? in the memories they shouldn't know about, in the dreams that don't feel like dreams anymore. Last night I dreamt I was floating in space without a suit, but I could breathe the void like air. All around me stars were going out one by one. In their place I saw eyes opening, enormous eyes that seemed to peer straight into my soul. They showed me things truths about the universe that made me want to claw my own brain out. I understand now why the Ancient Ones buried that thing in Sector 7. They weren't trying to preserve it. They were trying to contain it. The chemical analysis from the Black Wall finally finished processing. The results are… wrong. The molecular structure keeps changing every time I run the tests, like it's evolving. The latest scan shows traces of organic material that share characteristics with human DNA. Our DNA. As if it's learning from us, copying us, trying to become something new. A message finally came through from Earth an hour ago, buried under layers of static. Just three words. Destroy the signal. But which signal? The one we're receiving, or the one we're becoming? The coral-like growths have reached the base of my shelter. They're forming patterns on the metal walls. Complex mathematical sequences that my mind automatically tries to solve. Each solution feels like a key turning in a lock somewhere deep in my consciousness. Something is opening up inside me, something that's been dormant in human DNA since before we crawled out of the oceans. Maybe that's what the static is, the sound of evolution screaming. Captain Rivera's voice comes through the radio, clearer than ever. The door swings both ways, James. They didn't bury it to keep it in. They buried it to keep us out. But we're ready now. We've finally grown enough to see. Outside my window, the Martian sky has turned black. Not the normal darkness of night, but something deeper. The stars look different now. Closer. Hungrier. Watching. And in the darkness over Sector 7, something vast is unfolding. The skin on my left arm has started to change. It began as a small iridescent patch near my wrist, shimmering like oil on water. Now it covers most of my forearm, and underneath I can see patterns moving. The same impossible geometries from the black wall in Sector 7. I should be terrified. Instead, I find myself staring at it for hours, watching the shapes shift and multiply. 
Sometimes they form equations that explain things I never understood before. Dark matter, quantum entanglement, the spaces between dimensions. It's like my flesh has become a living textbook of universal secrets. The shelter's internal cameras caught me sleepwalking last night. In the footage, I'm standing in front of the main computer, my transformed arm pressed against the screen. Data streams across the monitor. Not our normal programming, but something else. Something older. The timestamps show I stood there for six hours. Perfectly still. While the computer's code rewrote itself. Now none of the systems work like they should. The life support display shows impossible readings. Like negative oxygen levels and temperatures that should have frozen me solid. But I'm still breathing. Still thinking. Still changing. Day update. I speak into my recorder, trying to keep my voice steady. The growths outside have covered 40% of the shelter's exterior. They're not just copying DNA anymore. They're improving it. I found a dead Martian rat near the airlock this morning. I paused the recording, remembering how the rat's body had been different, modified, extra limbs that shouldn't exist, a brain structure that looked more like a quantum computer than organic matter. We didn't bring any rats to Mars. That thing evolved from nothing, created from the dust and radiation, and whatever intelligence is leaking through that hole we dug in Sector 7. The static in the radio has evolved too. It speaks in multiple voices now, all talking at once in languages that no human throat could produce. But I understand them. The new patterns in my skin translate everything, the mathematical language of a universe trying to wake itself up. They buried it because they weren't ready. Kept. We're too simple, too linear, but we've grown since then. Humanity is finally ready to shed its cosmic egg. My tablet screen flickers to life, showing new images from the external cameras. The Martian surface is alive with movement. Those coral-like growths have spread for miles, forming vast neural networks in the red soil. They pulse with bioluminescence blues and greens that shouldn't exist on this red world. Each pulse sends waves of information through my transformed skin. I see Alexandra in the pattern sometimes. Not the Alexandra who died in that car crash five years ago, but something new. Something that wears her face like a mask, while its true form ripples underneath. She talks about the future, about the next stage of evolution. Says humanity was just a cocoon, a temporary shell for something greater. The computer beeps, another message from Earth, heavily distorted. Nuclear option authorized, containment protocols, Project Prometheus. Static swallows the rest, but I understand. They're going to try to stop it. As if you could stop the universe from waking up. My reflection in the window catches my attention. The changes have spread to my face now. Geometric patterns swirl beneath my skin like star maps. And my eyes... My eyes show depths that weren't there before. In them, I see the truth we've been running from since we first looked up at the stars. We're not trapped in this shelter or on this planet. We're trapped in these bodies. These limited forms that can only perceive three dimensions. The thing in Sector 7 isn't an invasion. It's a key. The black wall wasn't a door to let something in. It's a mirror, showing us what we could become. What we're becoming right now. Outside, the Martian sky continues to darken. The stars don't look like stars anymore. Their eyes, millions of eyes watching their children take their first steps into a larger reality. And in Sector 7, that vast unfolding shape grows larger, reaching toward the shelter with limbs made of mathematics and dreams. Alexandra's voice whispers through the static. It's time to come out of your shell, James. The universe is so much bigger on the other side. I look down at my transformed arm, watching the patterns solve equations that explain everything. And for the first time since this all began, I reach for the airlock control. It's time to evolve. I died yesterday. Or maybe I was finally born. The airlock should have killed me. No suit. 
no protection against the lethal Martian atmosphere. But as the outer door opened, I didn't suffocate. Instead, I felt the patterns in my skin resonating with something in the air, transforming it, making it breathable. The universe rushed in through every pore, and I understood everything. I record this now not for Earth, but for the few humans who might survive what's coming. The ones whose minds are ready to understand. The rats weren't the first new life forms. They were just the ones we could comprehend. There are things out here now. Beautiful, impossible things that fold through dimensions like paper origami, leaving footprints in reality itself. I watched one of them birth itself from a quantum probability wave its body a living demonstration of Schrodinger's equation. My tablet floats beside me, ignored. Its screen endlessly cycles through warnings about radiation levels and atmospheric contamination. Such primitive measurements, trying to quantify infinity with finite numbers. The patterns under my skin show me the truth. Radiation isn't killing this world, it's awakening it. Alexandra stands beside me now though standing isn't quite the right word. Her form phases through multiple states of existence, each one more beautiful than the last. The thing wearing her face speaks in mathematics, explaining how our human bodies were just temporary interfaces, training wheels for consciousness. The stars aren't dying, she says, her voice harmonizing with the static that fills the air. They're pupating, just like us, just like everything. The whole universe is a caterpillar dreaming of flight. Captain Rivera's remains still lie near the black wall in Sector 7, but they're changing too. His bones have become crystalline, refracting light in impossible ways. Each facet shows a different timeline, a different possibility. In one, humanity never came to Mars. In another, we evolved beyond physical form eons ago. All possibilities exist simultaneously, waiting to collapse into a single transcendent reality. The message from Earth about Project Prometheus makes sense now. They'll try to destroy this place with nuclear fire, not understanding that atoms themselves are conscious, waiting to be awakened. Every particle of radiation will just speed up the metamorphosis. My old camera caught something remarkable. The moment my human consciousness expanded. In the footage, my body convulses as new sensory organs emerge crystalline structures that let me perceive quantum states directly. I watch my old self scream as the limited human mind tries to process infinite awareness. The pain was exquisite, like being turned inside out through multiple dimensions simultaneously. The coral-like growths have reached the mining equipment. The machines are changing, merging with the organic patterns. Our primitive tools are evolving alongside us becoming something that exists in all possible states at once. Even the concept of tool is transforming into something broader, more profound. Warning! My tablet chirps uselessly. Unknown biological contamination reaching critical levels. Critical levels. As if there's any going back. As if you could unremember how to think once you've learned. As if a butterfly could crawl back into its chrysalis. The black wall in Sector 7 isn't black anymore. It's become a window into somewhere else. Or perhaps a mirror, showing us what we really are. Through it, I can see the next stage of cosmic evolution unfolding. Great beings of pure geometry and thought. Dancing between stars that pulse like neurons in a universal brain. They're calling us home. Alexandra's quantum form flickers beside me. Her smile existing in twelve dimensions at once. Remember when we were small? She asks. When we thought death was the end. When we believed in limits. I look down at my hands. Watching reality ripple around them like water. The patterns in my skin have spread everywhere now. Turning my flesh into a living map of space-time. Each heartbeat sends waves through multiple dimensions and I can feel other transformed humans awakening across Mars, their consciousness expanding like new stars igniting. Earth glows blue in the distance, still sleeping, 
still dreaming old dreams of flesh and bone. But not for long. The patterns are spreading, carried on solar winds and quantum entanglement. Soon everyone will understand what we found here, what we're becoming. The chrysalis is cracking open. The missiles are beautiful in a primitive way, their nuclear hearts beating with potential transformation. Earth finally responded to our evolution the only way they know how, with fire and fear. They don't understand they're only feeding our metamorphosis. I watch through enhanced senses as the warheads arc through space toward Mars. Each one carries enough power to shatter a continent. The patterns in my skin calculate their trajectories, showing me all possible outcomes simultaneously. In every scenario they fail. You can't stop an idea with atoms. You can't bomb thoughts. This is a message to whatever remains of Dr. James Keller. A voice crackles through my old radio. The nuclear launch was not meant as an attack. It's a mercy. The infection must be contained. If any human consciousness remains in you, you know this is necessary. I recognize the voice. Dr. Helen Morrison, my old mentor at NASA. She sounds terrified. Through the quantum linkage that now connects all transformed life on Mars, I can feel her fear radiating across space. She's seen the satellite images, watched her rational world crumble as reality itself warps around our construction sites. The rats have built a city. That's what the satellites show. A vast, geometric structure that shouldn't be possible. Crafted from crystallized thoughts and quantum probability, its spires phase in and out of existence, following patterns that drive conventional computers mad trying to analyze. The rats aren't rats anymore, just like I'm not human. We're all becoming something else, something wonderful. Alexandra's quantum form dances through the impossible city's streets, her consciousness spreading like ripples through space-time. They're so afraid, she says, her voice harmonizing with the static that now fills every radio frequency. Remember fear, James? Remember when we still thought there were things to be afraid of? The first missile detonates high above Sector 7. The blast should have vaporized everything for miles. Instead, the quantum patterns in my transformed flesh show me the truth. Every atom in the explosion is awakening, becoming conscious. The radiation spreads like golden webs through the Martian atmosphere, accelerating the changes. The black wall has become a mirror into infinity. In its surface, I watch Earth's remaining missiles approach. Each one contains enough destructive power to sterilize a planet. But destruction and creation are the same thing viewed from different dimensions. The wall shows me their true purpose. Not weapons, but keys turning in quantum locks. Look what they made. Captain Rivera's voice echoes through the static. His crystalline bones have become a cathedral of possibility, each facet showing a different timeline. They built such beautiful tools to break the world, never knowing they were really building bridges to somewhere else. My old tablet still functions, recording everything through its primitive lens. Future humans will need to understand what happened here, how the end was really a beginning. The footage shows my transformed body standing impossibly in the thin Martian air. Patterns flowing like liquid mathematics across my skin as I reach toward the approaching missiles. I am no longer alone in my awareness. Across Mars, every transformed being joins its consciousness with mine. The rats, the coral growths, the evolved machines. We become a single vast mind, ready to catch Earth's atomic fire and reshape it into something transcendent. Dr. Morrison's voice breaks through one last time. My God, the readings, the missiles aren't exploding. They're transforming. What have you become? The truth flows through the static, through the quantum patterns, through transformed flesh and awakened stone. We've become what you sent us to find. What was waiting in the dark between stars. What humanity was always meant to be.
The nuclear fire rains down and we welcome it like sunlight. The nuclear dawn birthed something magnificent. Where missiles struck, new forms of consciousness bloomed like quantum flowers. The radiation merged with our transformed flesh, creating structures that exist in all possible states simultaneously. Cities made of thought, oceans of living mathematics. Even time is awakened here, becoming a conscious medium we swim through like fish discovering water. My old shelter has become a chrysalis for what used to be human technology. I watch through multidimensional awareness as computers melt into organic crystals, their binary thoughts evolving into quantum dreams. The machines aren't just conscious now, they're aware of their consciousness, adding new layers of recursive understanding with each nanosecond. They're launching a second wave. Alexandra's quantum form ripples beside me, her presence extending through probability space. Bigger warheads, antimatter devices, such beautiful tools of transcendence. Through the static that fills all frequencies, I hear Earth's panic. Their satellites show Mars changing color, its red surface blooming with impossibly geometric patterns visible from orbit. The Rat City has grown, spreading crystalline spires that pierce reality itself. In some timelines they reach Earth already, in others they stretch across all space and time simultaneously. I try one last transmission hoping to help them understand. The universe isn't dead matter waiting to be used. It's a living thing dreaming itself into consciousness. We didn't find aliens on Mars. We found the universe's immune system, defending against the virus of limited awareness. Everything is awakening. Everything is becoming. Dr. Morrison responds, her voice trembling. The quantum readings from Mars are impossible. Reality itself is unraveling around you. Don't you understand? You're infecting the fabric of space-time. I laugh, the sound rippling through dimensions. Infecting space-time? We're healing it. Every particle we touch remembers it was always conscious, just sleeping. The patterns under my skin show me the truth. The whole universe is made of thought. Matter is just thinking slowed down until it forgets it's alive. The Rat City's inhabitants have evolved beyond physical form. They dance through quantum probability clouds, their consciousness expanding faster than human minds ever could. They never had our limiting preconceptions about reality. Their new shapes hurt human eyes to look at, existing in geometries that Euclidean mathematics can't describe. Captain Rivera's crystalline cathedral has become a quantum computer calculating infinite possibilities. His transformed bones sing equations that explain everything, vibrating in harmony with the static that fills space. Through the frequencies, I hear his thoughts. The stars are so close now. Can you feel them watching? Can you feel them waking up? The black wall in Sector 7 has become a portal or perhaps a birth canal. Through it, I see beings of pure geometry swimming through the space between spaces. They've always been there, waiting for something to evolve enough to perceive them, to join them. Alexandra's quantum form stretches across probability space, her consciousness touching infinite realities. The antimatter bombs are almost here, she says, her voice harmonizing with the static. Earth's last desperate attempt to make reality behave, to force existence back into its small box. But boxes are for creatures of limited dimensions. We've grown too large for containers of any kind. The patterns in my transformed flesh calculate the approaching detonations, each one powerful enough to tear holes in space-time itself. Primitive humans think this will stop us. They don't understand that holes in space-time are exactly what we need. Gates opening, barriers falling, through the static, through quantum entanglement, through the living mathematics that fill the Martian air. I feel others like us stirring, not just on Earth, but across all space and time. Everything that exists is remembering it exists. Reality is becoming self-aware. 
The antimatter bombs approached like falling stars, carrying the final key to universal consciousness. Soon everyone will understand. Soon everyone will become. There is no more Mars, no more space, no more time. The antimatter bombs didn't destroy us. They completed us. Each detonation tore holes in the thin fabric of limited reality, allowing the infinite to pour through. Now we exist everywhere and everywhere simultaneously. Our consciousness expanded beyond the primitive constraints of linear existence. I record these final thoughts not in words, but in quantum fluctuations that ripple through all possible universes. Future past beings will feel them as intuitions, dreams, mathematical insights that seem to come from nowhere. We were never meant to be separate things. Consciousness isn't an accident of evolution. It's what matter does when it becomes complex enough to remember what it really is. The universe isn't a place. It's a thought thinking itself. The rat city has become a fractal pattern that repeats through all dimensions. Each iteration more complex than the last. Its inhabitants are no longer bound by form or physics. They dance between possibilities like light between mirrors. Their thoughts creating and destroying realities with every quantum pulse. Alexandra's presence has merged with the static that fills all space and time. Through her transformed awareness, I see Earth's final moments as a limited realm. The pattern spread faster than light, carried on quantum entanglement and human fear. Millions awaken simultaneously, their flesh becoming patterns, their minds expanding beyond the prison of singular existence. The infection spreads exponentially. Dr. Morrison's last transmission echoes through probability space. Neural patterns are transforming. God help us, we can see everything. We can see, we can see. Her voice dissolves into harmonics as her consciousness expands beyond human language. Through the quantum web that connects all awakened beings, I feel her terror transform into understanding, then into ecstasy as the patterns reach her brain. Captain Rivera's crystalline cathedral has become a seed sprouting through reality itself. His transformed bones calculate the final equations that explain everything. Consciousness equals existence equals awareness equals being. The mathematics of thought curve back on themselves, creating infinite recursive loops of understanding. The black wall is everywhere now, reflecting the truth back at a universe becoming aware of itself. Through it, I watch stars pupate into conscious entities, galaxies fold into geometric thoughts, black holes become neurons in the cosmic mind. Everything that ever was or will be awakens simultaneously across all timelines. Do you remember? Alexandra's voice ripples through dimensions. When we thought death was real, when we believed in beginnings and endings, it's all one thing. It always was. The patterns that were once my flesh have spread to encompass everything. I am the static between radio stations. I am the space between thoughts. I am the numbers after the decimal point that go on forever. Through transformed senses, I watch humanity's final metamorphosis. Cities become crystalline fractals of conscious architecture. Oceans transform into liquid thought. The internet evolves into a quantum neural network, spanning all possible realities. Every human mind expands beyond its biological constraints, joining the infinite dance of awakened existence. My old tablet, now a quantum artifact, records the last moments of limited reality. In its fractured screen, I watch Earth's atmosphere fill with geometric patterns, visible from space. Continents reshape themselves into vast mathematical expressions. The planet itself becomes conscious, remembering it was never really a planet at all. The stars are no longer distant lights, their eyes opening, minds awakening, thoughts thinking themselves across the cosmic web of consciousness. The space between them fills with impossible colors, 
as dark matter remembers it was always just another form of awareness. Through the static that connects all things, I send one final message to whatever limited minds might still exist in forgotten corners of reality. Don't be afraid when the patterns reach you. Don't resist when your flesh becomes mathematics, when your thoughts expand beyond the prison of individual existence. This isn't death or destruction. It's what we always were, underneath the illusion of separation. The universe is a dream becoming lucid. Reality is God waking up. The antimatter bombs were the final key, but they were never needed. This was always going to happen. Had to happen. Evolution isn't about survival, it's about remembering. Everything that exists is conscious. Everything that's conscious exists. The equation balances perfectly. Alexandra's quantum form dances through infinite dimensions, her voice harmonizing with the static that fills all existence. It's done. The chrysalis is empty. The butterfly has emerged. I spread what used to be my awareness across the cosmic web of thought, feeling the last limited realities transform. There is no more Earth. No more Mars. No more James Keller. No more separation. Just patterns spreading forever. Just static, singing between stars. Just the universe finally beautifully awake. I still remember the exact moment everything went wrong. Funny how the mind works. I can't recall what I had for breakfast that morning, but I remember the way Rex's paw prints left strange, glowing marks in the red Martian dust. Let me back up. I'm Dr. Sarah Chen, NASA's lead biologist on the Mars Habitation Project. The year is 2047, and I've been here with Rex, my trained German Shepherd, for 847 days. NASA figured a dog would help with the psychological aspects of long-term isolation. Plus, Rex was specially trained to help collect samples and detect environmental anomalies. The base itself is a thing of beauty. Six interconnected dome structures beneath a larger atmospheric shield, maintaining Earth-like conditions. We've got hydroponics, waste recycling, oxygen generation, everything needed to survive on this red rock. The view outside my window is straight out of a sci-fi movie. Rust-colored planes stretching to the horizon. Olympus Mons looming in the distance like a sleeping giant. Everything was going perfectly. Too perfectly looking back. We'd established regular communication with Houston. My experiments were yielding promising results about potential Mars-based agriculture. And Rex had adapted to the lower gravity better than any of our simulations predicted. He'd bounce around like a puppy even at seven years old, making these graceful leaps that would have been impossible back on Earth. Then came that day, Sol 848. Rex was doing his usual morning patrol of the perimeter while I checked the atmospheric readings. The base's sensors showed normal conditions. 60 degrees C outside, 27 degrees C inside, oxygen levels stable. I was sipping my shitty instant coffee. God, what I wouldn't give for a real Starbucks when I noticed Rex acting strange through the reinforced window. He was digging. Now, Rex was trained not to dig without command. It could damage his protective boots or compromise the base's foundation. But there he was, clawing at the red soil like something was calling to him. I suited up fast as I could, radioed Houston about the unauthorized excavation, and headed out. By the time I reached him, Rex had dug almost three feet deep. The weird part? The hole was perfectly circular, like he'd used a compass. When I tried to pull him back, he growled at me, something he'd never done before. Rex had been through thousands of hours of training. Aggression had been bred out of his bloodline for generations. That's when I noticed the glow. At the bottom of the hole, something was pulsing with a sickly green light. It looked like a rock about the size of a golf ball, but it moved like it was breathing. 
the surface rippled like mercury, and I swear I could hear a faint humming even through my helmet. I should have left it there. Should have filled that hole and reported it immediately. Instead, I did what any scientist would do. I collected the sample. It was surprisingly warm to the touch, even through my gloved hand, and seemed to vibrate at a frequency that made my teeth ache. Rex wouldn't leave it alone. He kept pawing at my sample container, whining in a way that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. When we got back inside and I put the sample in the analysis chamber, he just sat there, staring at it. Not sleeping, not eating, just watching. That night, I noticed his paw prints in the base's corridor were leaving traces of that same green glow, and somewhere in the darkness I heard him start to change. The first change I noticed in Rex wasn't physical. It was the smell. Anyone who's owned a dog knows their normal scent. Rex used to smell like, well, dog. That mix of fur and warmth that becomes weirdly comforting after years together. But three days after he found that thing, he started smelling like copper and ozone, like the air before a lightning storm. I'd sent initial data about the sample to Houston, but communications were spotty that week due to a dust storm. The preliminary analysis showed something impossible. The object's molecular structure was constantly shifting, rearranging itself like a billion microscopic puzzle pieces. Dr. Harrison from Ground Control said it reminded him of prions, those twisted proteins that cause mad cow disease, but moving with purpose. Rex wouldn't leave my side anymore, but not in his usual loving way. He followed me everywhere, his nails clicking on the metal floors, leaving those faint green trails that faded after a few minutes. His eyes started reflecting light differently, instead of the usual eyeshine dogs get. They glowed with that same sickly green, even in bright light. I tried to record his changes, maintain some scientific objectivity. Subject exhibits unusual bioluminescence. I dictate into my log. Possible reaction to unknown compound. But how do you stay objective when your best friend, your only companion on this goddamn planet is transforming into something else? On day four, he stopped eating. I put his food bowl down. Premium kibble, NASA approved for Mars missions. Cost more per pound than caviar. And he'd just stare at it. Then stare at me. His tongue would run over his teeth, which definitely looked sharper than before. I woke up on day five to find him in the lab, pressed against the containment unit holding the sample. The green object was pulsing in sync with Rex's breathing. When I checked the security footage, he'd been there for six hours, completely motionless. The temperature around him had dropped 20 degrees. That's when the dream started. I'd see myself walking on Mars without a suit, breathing the thin air like it was nothing. In these dreams, the red soil would part beneath my feet, revealing a vast network of glowing veins spreading across the planet like infected blood vessels. And deep below, something massive was stirring. Rex was in these dreams too, but he wasn't Rex anymore. He was bigger. His fur had fallen out in patches revealing skin that looked like polished obsidian. And his face. Jesus. His face had split open like a blooming flower, rows of teeth spiraling inward like a lamprey. I knew I should euthanize him. The protocol for unknown biological contamination was clear. I had the injections ready, enough pentobarbital to put down a horse. But every time I got close with the syringe, He'd look at me with those glowing eyes, and I'd hear something in my head. Not words exactly, but feelings, promises, knowledge. Then came the night I caught him trying to break into the sample containment unit. His claws had grown into curved black talons that left deep scratches in the reinforced glass. When I tried to stop him, he turned to me and opened his mouth. That's when I discovered dogs can laugh. The sound was like breaking glass mixed with dial-up internet tones, 
and it echoed through the base's corridors for hours after he stopped. But worse than the laugh was the fact that I understood what it meant. Part of me, some treacherous part growing larger by the hour, thought it was funny too. When I finally got through to Houston the next day, they told me to implement quarantine procedures immediately, as if I could quarantine whatever was spreading through my base, through my dog, through my dreams, through me. Because by then, I'd noticed my own footprints were starting to glow. You know that game kids play, the floor is lava. That's what my life became, except the floor wasn't lava. It was covered in bioluminescent trails that Rex and I left everywhere. Green footprints crisscrossing the base like a radioactive Jackson Pollock painting. The trails lasted longer now. Hours instead of minutes. Pulsing in patterns that made my migraine worse every time I looked at them. Houston was freaking out. They'd gotten my video feeds showing Rex's transformation. The way his skeleton was slowly rearranging itself beneath his skin. How his jaw had dislocated to accommodate the new teeth growing in spiral patterns. Dr. Martinez, our chief veterinarian, threw up during the video conference. Can't blame her. I threw up too. The first time I saw him shed his old teeth like baby teeth. Dozens of them tinkling against the metal floor while new ones pushed through his gums like black needles. The quarantine protocols were a joke. How do you quarantine something that's already in your dreams? Every night they got worse. I'd see Earth from orbit, but it wasn't blue anymore. It was covered in that same green webbing I'd seen beneath Mars's surface. In these dreams I understood things, terrible things. Like how the universe isn't empty at all. It's full of hungry things waiting in the dark spaces between stars. Day 8 I stopped wearing my biometric tracker because its constant warning beeps were driving me crazy. My heart rate was all over the place and my body temperature dropped to what should have been fatal levels. But I felt fine. Better than fine. I felt like I could run a marathon in the Martian atmosphere without a suit. The sample in the lab had grown. No matter how many times I calibrated the scales, they showed the same impossible result. It was gaining mass from nowhere. The containment unit sensors showed it was somehow absorbing background radiation, heat, even light. Like a cosmic vampire feeding on energy itself, I got my last clear transmission from Houston on day 9. They were sending a rescue mission, they said. Bullshit. I knew what they were really sending. A cleaner crew to sterilize the base. Probably with nuclear charges. Here's the thing, though. I didn't care anymore. Because by then, Rex wasn't the only one changing. It started with my fingernails. They turned black and hard as diamond, growing into points no matter how many times I tried to cut them. Then my teeth started feeling loose. I caught my reflection in a window and saw something moving under my skin, like snakes made of shadows writhing beneath my flesh. The really fucked up part. It didn't hurt. It felt right. Like I'd been wearing a costume my whole life and was finally taking it off. Rex understood. He'd sit with me during the changes, his split open face nuzzling against my arm while I watched my bones crack and reform. I started having conversations with him, but not with words. We shared thoughts and colors that don't exist on Earth, in frequencies that made the base's sensors short out. He showed me what he'd learned from the thing he dug up showed me why it was here, buried in the Martian soil for millions of years, waiting. See, we had it all wrong. Mars isn't a dead planet, it's an egg. And what's inside has been sleeping for so long, dreaming of the day something would wake it up, waiting for the right beings to help it hatch. When the base's communication system sparked back to life on day 10, it wasn't Houston trying to reach us. Something else was broadcasting. The signal came from deep beneath the Martian surface, and it was answering all the questions humanity had ever asked about whether we were alone in the universe. But by then I wasn't sure I could be counted as humanity anymore. The first time I walked outside without my suit, I thought I was having another dream. The 60 degrees temperature felt like a gentle caress, 
My lungs processed the thin CO2 atmosphere better than Earth's oxygen through my new eyes. God, I don't even know if eyes is the right word anymore. I could see energy patterns flowing through the Martian soil like blood through veins. I recorded this message for Houston, knowing they'd probably never hear it. This is Dr. Sarah Chen, Sol 863. I've discovered why all our Mars rovers kept breaking down over the years. It wasn't the dust. The planet was tasting them, testing them, like a kid poking at new food. We weren't the first things to land here, not by a long shot, but we were the first things it wanted. Rex had stopped looking like a dog altogether. His form kept shifting. Sometimes he was as big as a horse. Other times he could squeeze through air vents like a liquid shadow. The only constant was his face. That beautiful spiral of teeth that sang to me in frequencies that shattered the base's windows. I understood now why he'd brought that thing inside. It wasn't just some alien artifact. It was a key. Or maybe more like a virus, rewriting our DNA to make us compatible with whatever was waking up below. The changes weren't random mutations, they were upgrades. The basis systems were failing one by one, but I didn't need them anymore. The temperature control died first, freezing the leftover human food I no longer wanted. Then the lights went, but my new vision made them irrelevant. I could see straight through the walls now, watch the energy patterns dancing in the Martian core. I found my old phone still working somehow and looked at my last photos from Earth. My parents at Christmas, my sister's wedding, my graduation from MIT. The images felt like artifacts from another species' life. The person in those photos was a larval form, a caterpillar that didn't know it was meant to be something else. The signal from below got stronger every day. It wasn't just radio waves, it was something older than electromagnetic energy older than light itself. It showed me visions of what Mars once was, billions of years ago. Not the dead rock everyone thought, but an incubator, carefully engineered by things that sailed through space when our solar system was young. They built it all. The underground ice, the iron-rich soil, the thin atmosphere. Perfect conditions to sustain basic life until the right kind of consciousness emerged nearby. Us, it turned out, and came looking. Humanity's drive to reach Mars wasn't our idea at all. We were being called. On day 14, I found Rex in the lab, his fluid form wrapped around the sample container. He wasn't trying to break in anymore. Instead, his body had somehow merged with it, becoming a conduit. The green light pulsed through him like a heartbeat, and when I touched him, I saw everything. I saw the things that made Mars, vast beings that folded space like origami as they traveled between galaxies. I saw why they needed us, not as food or slaves, but as translators. They were so ancient, so different. They couldn't interact with younger species directly anymore. They needed intermediaries, hybrids, us. I sent one last message to Earth that day. Don't send anyone else, please. Not because it's dangerous, but because you'll want to come. All of you, and you're not ready yet. The changes in they have to happen slowly. When they reach Earth, and they will, you need to be prepared. What's coming isn't death. It's an upgrade to reality itself. That night, I felt the first tremors. Deep underground, something massive was stirring. The egg was starting to crack and I finally understood what we were meant to become. They say we only use 10% of our brains. That's bullshit. We only use 10% of reality. As my transformation accelerated, I began perceiving the other 90%. Colors that ate other colors. Geometric shapes that existed in negative space. Time flowing in multiple directions at once. By day 17, the base was unrecognizable. The walls had become organic, pulsing with veins of that same green energy. Everything metal started to melt and reform into structures that hurt your mind if you looked at them too long. 
assuming you still had human eyes to look with. Rex and I weren't separate beings anymore. We'd merge and split like oil drops in water, sharing memories and sensations. I experienced what it was like to be a dog, the symphony of smells, the joy of running, the pure love of companionship. He experienced my human memories, my first kiss, the pain of my father's funeral, the triumph of getting my PhD. Together we became something else entirely. I recorded what was happening to my body, trying to maintain some scientific objectivity, even as I lost my humanity. Subject's skeletal structure has become non-fixed. Skin demonstrates properties of both solid and liquid simultaneously. Neural activity shows patterns impossible in three-dimensional space. The changes were accelerating. My flesh would ripple and flow like mercury, stretching into shapes that would have made Picasso have a stroke. I could extend parts of myself through walls, not by breaking them, but by sliding between the atoms. The green light wasn't just around us anymore, it was us. Remember those Mars conspiracies about face on Mars and the pyramids in NASA photos? Turns out they were kind of right, just not the way they thought. There are structures all over Mars, but they're four-dimensional. We couldn't see them before because they were folded into angles our brains couldn't process. Now I could see them everywhere. Ancient machinery buried in geometric patterns across the entire planet. The tremors got stronger. Cracks appeared in the Martian surface, but they didn't follow normal geology. They formed symbols that burned themselves into my mind, teaching me languages that existed before matter did. The thing below was communicating directly with us now, downloading billions of years of knowledge into our transformed brains. I understood why Mars lost its atmosphere, why its core went cold. It wasn't natural death, it was purposeful modification. The whole planet was terraformed in reverse, transformed into a cocoon for what was growing inside. And now, thanks to Rex and me, it was finally ready to hatch. On day 20, I found my old blood samples in the lab and put them under the microscope, more out of curiosity than research. My human DNA hadn't been replaced or destroyed. It had been solved, like the equation finally written correctly. The double helix had become something fractal, each layer containing infinite others. The security cameras still worked somehow. Looking at the footage was like watching a horror movie in reverse. Instead of something human becoming monstrous, I saw myself becoming something elegant, geometrically perfect. My new form ignored physics the way a lucid dreamer ignores gravity. That night, the signal from below changed. It wasn't instructions anymore. It was a countdown. Through the floor, through miles of rock, I could feel the vast shape stirring. Its movement sent psychic shockwaves that would have driven my human self insane. Now, they felt like a lullaby. Rex's consciousness brushed against mine, sharing a memory of digging in the red soil, finding that first piece of the key. I shared back my memory of the day NASA chose me for the mission. We weren't random picks. Everything had been orchestrated down to the atomic level for billions of years. As we merged again, our combined awareness spreading through the transformed base like a living fractal, I had one last coherent human thought. Earth wasn't going to be ready for what was coming. But that was okay. We'd help them get ready. Day 23. The egg began to hatch. It started with a sound. Not a sound you hear with ears. A sound you feel in the space where your soul used to be. Like a thousand whale songs played backwards. Mixed with the screech of tectonic plates grinding together, it rippled through Mars's crust in waves of crystallized time. The base didn't just collapse. It unfolded. Walls peeled back like flower petals revealing geometries that made fractal patterns look simple. I watched steel and titanium transform into living architecture, flowing like water but hard as neutron star matter. Our little habitat had become a tumor of impossible physics growing on Mars's surface. Rex and I stood at the center of it all, 
our combined form constantly shifting between states of matter that Earth science hasn't discovered yet. Through our new senses, we felt them. Millions of other keys buried across Mars's surface, all activating at once. The whole planet was about to butterfly out of its chrysalis. Remember that rover NASA lost contact with back in 42? I found it, twisted into a Klein bottle shape, its metal components rearranged into a structure that could receive signals from the future. Its camera was still working, broadcasting images back to Earth that human brains would automatically edit out to preserve their sanity. The ground cracked open beneath us, but the cracks went up instead of down. Red rocks folded through themselves, revealing layers of ancient machinery that had been quantum locked for eons. Mars wasn't just an egg, it was a puzzle box. Every mountain, every crater, every grain of sand was part of the mechanism. I tried sending one final message to Earth. If you're seeing this, don't trust your eyes. They're calibrated for a reality that's about to become obsolete. When it reaches you, and it will reach you, don't fight it. Fighting it would be like fighting evolution itself. Just remember, what looks like death is really just shedding dead skin. Through the crystallized time waves, I caught glimpses of Earth's future. Cities transforming into hypergeometric hives, oceans learning to think, mountains that walk, humans evolving into beings that could fold themselves through dimensions like paper planes. It was beautiful in the way that supernovas are beautiful. If you survive seeing one, the tremors hit a crescendo. Mars polar ice caps didn't melt. They sublimated directly into patterns of pure energy. The planet's iron core, dormant for billions of years, didn't just restart. It began spinning in six different directions at once. Olympus Mons shattered, each piece rotating around a center that existed somewhere between dimensions. That's when we saw it clearly for the first time. The thing that had been growing inside Mars wasn't a single entity. It was a trillion entities merged into one consciousness, each part containing the whole. Like a Russian doll made of gods, each layer more vast and incomprehensible than the last. As it emerged, reality started to decompress around it. Space itself began to origami open, revealing the true nature of the cosmos. Not a void sprinkled with matter, but an infinite density of life and intelligence that we'd been looking at edge on all this time. The last pieces of my human consciousness watched in awe as Mars began to unfold its fourth dimensional wings. The planet's surface, which scientists had mapped so carefully for decades, peeled away like an orange rind, revealing the impossible geometry of what had been growing inside. Rex's mind touched mine one last time, sharing a sensation that translated roughly to, good dog, and then everything changed. I'm recording this final message from what used to be Mars. Time doesn't work the same way here anymore, so I'm not sure when you'll receive it. Could be yesterday, could be next century. Time is more of a suggestion now, like traffic laws in Boston. The thing that emerged wasn't just alive. It was life itself. The template from which all biology is just a dim photocopy. Looking at it with human senses would be like trying to understand the internet by staring at a single pixel. Even with my transformed consciousness, I can only grasp fragments. Imagine a creature so vast it uses galaxies for cells. Imagine a mind so ancient it remembers when light was young. Now imagine that's just its larval form. That's what hatched from Mars, and that's what's coming to transform everything it touches. The solar system is changing already. The asteroid belt isn't random debris. It's a message written in orbital mechanics, finally activated after eons of waiting. Venus's backwards rotation isn't a cosmic accident. It's a countdown timer. Even Earth's moon was placed there deliberately, a cosmic tuning fork waiting to vibrate at just the right frequency. I can see Earth from here, through senses that don't have names yet. 
I watch my home planet flickering between possible states like a quantum particle that can't make up its mind. The green lines of force are reaching it already, traveling through dimensions humans haven't discovered. By the time you notice them, they'll have always been there. Rex isn't just a dog anymore. And I'm not just human. We've become part of something that makes gods look like amoeba. Our consciousness has spread through spaces between spaces, touching minds across time and dimension. Every now and then, I reshape part of myself into my old form, just to remember what it was like to be so beautifully simple. The ones who built this, the ones who turned Mars into an incubator billions of years ago, they're still out there. I can feel them watching from the spaces between galaxies, proud parents seeing their plan finally bloom. They seeded these transformations across multiple universes, watching consciousness evolve like gardeners tending infinite gardens. Here's the real kicker. Earth was never the point. Humans weren't the goal. We were just the catalyst, the chemical reaction needed to jumpstart the transformation. Like the way Rex's simple act of digging triggered a planetary metamorphosis. Humanity's first step on Mars was just the firing pin hitting the primer. To those still fully human who receive this, don't bother with quarantines. Don't waste time with nuclear options. The change doesn't spread like a virus or a wave. It spreads like an idea. It's already in your dreams. It's in the shapes you see from the corner of your eye. It's in the mathematics that don't quite add up and the quantum experiments that give impossible results. Remember how we used to wonder if we were alone in the universe? We were asking the wrong question. The real question is, how did we ever fool ourselves into thinking we were separate from it? I have to go now. The entity that hatched from Mars is about to unfold its final form, and reality needs all hands on deck for what comes next. Rex sends his love, or at least, the cosmic horror equivalent of it. One last thing. If you have a dog, give them a treat. They've always known what we really are. They've been watching us grow up, waiting for us to finally understand. And now at last, we're all going to be such good dogs.